lights, camera, action. Hello, everybody. My name is Moon, like the sun and the moon, and I am the instructor today for the Frank Egan lecture, What to Do in Medical Emergencies. So the purpose of this video and this lecture is not for patient care. There are many classes you can take on that. This purpose of this video, the intended audience, are for people who are bystanders, such as family, friends, other concerned individuals, coworkers, classmates, and you find somebody you care about having a medical emergency, and of course you want to call 911, but then what? What else can you do to increase chance of patient survival as well as minimize any side effects, any unforeseen circumstances? What can you do to in make the process a little more efficient, get them to the hospital sooner and safer, and that is what this is, and we're gonna take about an hour. Uh, any, anybody new show up? Any new students show up? Okay, if you, anybody new who shows up, please uh, announce yourself in the chat. Okay, so, um, and if the screen is at all difficult to see for you, please let me know, that way I can, that way I can do something about it. Hi. Yes, well, you can see the chats, the participants list here. Oh, we have a We've got a few people here. Um, yeah. Are you gonna take? Can we keep attendance with that somehow? Well, what I do is I have students uh, announce their name and email address, so I put it in this log file. Oh, okay, perfect. Because then we can give that to Isabella Safar at the end because she asked for attendance. Oh, will they get a certificate or something? I have no idea. I don't oh, know. Okay. All right, uh, the, good. So the person you heard in the background is telling me that somebody else wants a copy of names and email addresses. So this list will be shared. Anybody else? Oh, any, yes. So we have a sign-in sheet for any people who show up in person. Okay. So in any medical emergency, the most important person in that scene to you is you not the person who's sick, not the other people, it's you. And it goes, it's as simple as you can't help anybody if you get hurt. Uh, it doesn't matter how much this patient is important to you, they are the center of your being, your soul, it doesn't matter if you get hurt, you can't help the person you care about. Uh, you've experienced, you've uh, encountered this concept already if you've been on an airplane and i'll open it up to the chat and any voice does anybody know what they say on the airplane you should do if the oxygen masks fall down anybody paid attention to your safety briefings just before flight what do they say about the oxygen masks when they fall from the ceiling Somebody here must have been on an airplane. Well, don't stand up, of course, but what about those? Yes, yes, uh, Nicolette, help yourself. Uh, what, can you, what does that mean about the oxygen mask? What are you supposed to do with the oxygen mask when they fall from the ceiling? I mean, they say a lot of things in the safety briefing, right? They say where the, where the ex emergency exits are and all that. Correct, Andrew, put it on yourself before you help somebody else because uh, in a in a catastrophic depressurization on an airplane, then you will lose consciousness within seconds, and so getting those masks on yourself is crucial so that you are still conscious and able to help the person next to you. Put the mask on yourself before you put it on anybody else you care about. Similar idea here. So. You show up at a potential emergency, with not just a medical emergency, but any kind of emergency. Emergency. If you get hurt, if you if you put on the hero hat, you go into hero mode. You rush into a burning building. You challenge a mob of angry people. You try to pull off a barking, biting dog. If you get hurt, what's going to happen is you're probably not going to help the person you're at, you're trying to save, and now. There's two people who are victims. We have to, there has to, we need two ambulances, two crews, increasing the risk by double to all first responders. 
So if you see something suspicious, if you see something distressing, what you have to first do is get to a safe place. A safe place could be across the street, it could be 10 feet away, it could be around the block, it could be the other side of the city. You, you do what you gotta do to make sure you are safe. Once you are safe, then you can call 911. Yes, the TV and movies and once in a while a newspaper shows a hero rushing into the scene and saving uh, somebody's life. But what they don't show on TV and movies for sure and sometimes on newspapers are the people who rushed in there, got hurt, and now they're just added to the list of victims. So be safe. Okay, these are dangers to you from outside the patient. Burning buildings, unstable roofs, uh, holes in the ground, rickety staircases, all of these things could hurt you if you jump in there without training, without backup, without equipment. I see some people join. If you are new to this chat, to this seminar, and you are a student, please put your full name and email address, full name and email address in the chat. In the chat, type your full name and email address so we can give you credit for being here. These are dangers to you from inside, from outside the patient. But what are possible dangers to you? Please put your full name and email address in the chat. And email address. In one line. In one line, not separate lines. Okay, so these are dangers to you from outside the patient. But could there be a danger to you as a bystander that is coming from inside the patient? Anybody, uh, voice or chat? Anybody can get an idea? Anybody has a suggestion? What could be a danger to you that came from inside the patient. Uh, Caitlin Figueroa, I need your email address. Please put your full name and email address in one line. One line. Anybody else join us? Vomit, okay. All right, so about vomit. Um, yes, it's unsightly, it smells bad, it probably tastes bad but it doesn't really turn you into a victim in itself. You just, you know, wash off, change your clothes, and you'll be fine. But what's in that vomit that could be uh, more serious, more longer lasting? Oh, well, you did put it in the second half, passable illness. So illnesses, in, uh, infectious diseases, that is what we're worried about. Okay, uh, toxins, absolutely, toxins, uh, uh, if they uh, ingested bleach, or if some kind of toxic, like uh, insecticide, you know, your, your co work you are working at Home Depot, and then there's a commotion over at the gardening supply center. And you know the people who work over there, they're your friends, and one of them even owes you money. So to make sure they are still okay, you rush over there and see your, see your best friend covered in this green, stinky liquid before you rush over there, grab him, pull him up, and say, speak to me, speak to me, talk to me, buddy, talk to me, man. You don't want to have this green, stinky liquid on you either. So what I'm getting at is protect yourself. How? With mask and gloves. Mask and gloves. Uh, this, vid this lecture has been given for several years in a row, and before the pandemic, the idea of having a ready supply of masks and gloves uh, was a little far-fetched because most people don't carry around those things. Even healthcare workers who are off-duty doesn't. But now, after the pandemic, that's not an issue, right? Everybody has a convenient pair of plastic or vinyl gloves somewhere on their person, and they will probably have like a mask in the glove compartment or your pocket bag. Um, for those of you who are saying, what gloves? I don't have any gloves. Okay, so go to the supermarket. Now every supermarket has a section where you can buy a box of gloves in your size. The, it's usually in the uh, paper products section of your supermarket. So after this, go over there, stop by the grocery store, buy a box of gloves in your size, and maybe um, 
a size for your family members too. And if it's like, if you're in a household with different hand sizes, then go ahead, get the large or the extra large, okay? The, it doesn't have to be a perfect fit for safety gloves as long as you can get them on. Thank you, Caitlin. So let me copy your information into the attendance log. So, so far I have three students who will get credit for being here today. If anybody else is new and did not give me their name and email address and want to be credited for being here today, please make yourself known in the chat. Okay, so mask and gloves, mask and gloves. I now always have pairs of vinyl gloves, cheap $10 per box, a pair of gloves in my jacket pocket, in my car, in convenient places, in my backpack, just for whenever. You know, it doesn't have to be a medical emergency. It can be like when you pump your gas, pump gas, you know, those are, that's a convenient place to use gloves, right? When you use a public bathroom, that's a good time to uh, have a pair of gloves on you. Okay, so now you're safe and protected. You're safe, and now you're protected. Now what do you do? Well, now you can help this person. So you saw a potential emergency and you are in a safe place and you decide, I better call 911. Well, what are, what's the criteria for calling 911? When is a good time to call 911? Uh, let me jump right down to this screen here and say, when in doubt, when in doubt, call 911. What if you call 911, it turns out to be nothing. It's okay, it's all right, they'll show up and then they will assess the situation. Assess is a fancy word for figure out what's going on, and it will, they will uh, decide, you know what, this is not, not a big deal, there was, there was no emergency, and there, no harm, no foul, nobody's going to be billed. They can't bill you if they don't transport you, so they, uh, as, as in the ambulance company. So they'll just say, all right, well, I'm glad to see you're okay, and everybody leaves. So there, no big deal. Now, if too many people did that, well, that's a, that's a draw or a drain on the resources of this EMS world. So that's not so good. But don't worry about that for yourself. Your own safety, the safety of the ones you love, if something bothers you or scares you, then go ahead, call 911. You know what, I should have mentioned this. How do I know this? Where, where am I speaking from? What makes me the expert? and these kinds of things. So I should have, what I should have done was tell you that uh, I have been working on the New York City ambulance here for over 10 years. I am a New York State paramedic, and I am also, I've also been an EMS instructor for, the, for about the same num amount of years. Uh, I also, I teach CPR classes here at Queensboro, and I'm teaching, I'm co-teaching an EMT class here I teach paramedics over at LaGuardia Community College, and that is my, that is my claim to fame. Okay. I am a medical doctor, yes. Okay. So let's get back here. Oh, Alicia, thank you. Let me add you to the attendance law. Very good, okay. So, when in doubt, oh, when in doubt, call 911. But there are some particulars though, like what, what makes you, what would make you think that, okay, I'm not just calling 911 just to be safe, like there really is something going on. All right, obvious serious injury, that makes sense, right? Broken bone, well actually there's no way to know if a bone is broken, right? But there is severe, there is pain in a body part from some kind of accident. So obviously call 911. Anybody who cannot get themselves safely to the hospital, what is this word safely? What does it make, whoops, when should you call 911 and when should you take an Uber or the bus or the subway to a acute care facility? So if there's something about the situation where by not taking an ambulance, you're making the situation worse. So if somebody injured their leg and now they're limping around, not only could trying to stay on that limb cause the injury to get worse, but now that they're limping, what if they trip and fall down the stairs, off the curb, getting into a taxi, and now they've also increased the injury. Um, if you call 911, then ambulance will come, EMTs will, uh, their most important job really is to assess the situation, 
figure out what's really going on and then do the appropriate thing. If they did see that there is a painful deformity in a limb, then they will splint it. If there is a difficulty with breathing, they'll give you oxygen. If you're bleeding, if you're bleeding, they will stop the bleed and all these wonderful things. Uh, there's, here's something that not many people are aware of is a unusual or in, in the technical jargon, altered mental status. Altered meaning change from their usual situ status. So uh, let's say we have a 90-year-old person with dementia. Dementia was growing for the past five years. And today, they're confused. Well, maybe they've been confused. Confusion is a medical term, by the way. It's not the, it's not the vernacular. It's not the popular definition of confusion, but the medical definition of confusion. Anyway, um, they are confused today. Well, should you call 911? Well, were they this mental status yesterday? Were they this mental status for the past five years? Then maybe that's not a reason to call 911. But they, if they were up and at them, spry, uh, sharp, sharp as attack yesterday, and usually that way, and now they are confused, that's a problem, right? So that's a reason to call 911. ABCs. What are ABCs? In, in healthcare, ABCs are airway, breathing, and circulation. Okay, so airway problems. How will you know if somebody has an airway problem? Well, they are visibly trying to suck in air. They have, uh, there's something about their mouth or throat that makes it difficult for them to breathe, such as choking, that's the big one. Allergic reaction, that's the big scare. Breathing, well, that's when somebody says, I can't breathe, I, I'm unable to catch my breath. And finally, and also circulation. Circulation, which means the circulatory system, the arteries and veins, getting blood around and around, and also the heart. The heart is part of the circulation system and their job is to move blood and around and around. So if the blood is leaking or leaking out, that's bad, okay, so bleeding. If the skin looks pale uh, and cool and sweaty, so not everybody who's sweaty needs 911. I was at the gym yesterday, I'm going to the gym later today, I will be sweaty, I don't need to go to the hospital. But if my skin is sweaty and cool and pale, that's the big one, call 911. If the pulse is weak and irregular or too fast, call 911. Um, how, do you, how are you supposed to check that? Look, if you don't know, if you have not been trained, then that's not something for you to assess. But that's something that healthcare providers will check for. Would you like to know how to assess a pulse? To know if it is too slow, too fast, or just right? Then, or too strong, or too weak, or just right? Take a first aid class. And what if there's no pulse? Then start CPR. I'm going back one, one slide. Take, uh, take a CPR or first aid course. Queensboro, uh, this, this lecture, uh, sponsor time, this lecture is made possible in part by Queensboro Community College. Queensboro Community College has both CPR and first aid courses. I know all the instructors there they all have more experience than I do. They're all very good. You can't go wrong with it. It's one credit hour. For those of you who find the Queensboro Community College tuition a little pricey and you already have your credit hours, you don't need any more, but you do want this information, this knowledge for yourself, all, all you need to do is type to Google for CPR and your zip code and you will get lots and lots of private providers, certifi certification classes in your local area. They're usually around $100 per person. I haven't checked lately, I'm not sure about the price, but you can shop around and just learn about it, get enough information and practice so they'll have mannequins so you can practice on and equipment so you can practice on there. Okay, so, all right. So now you have decided to call 911 and what do you do about it? What, what do you do when you're on the phone? Okay, so for those of you who have called 911, you got to the 911 operator, which is not the medical 911, the EMS operator. The 911 operator has to first find out what's going on before they can route you to the appropriate department. 
that will handle your call, like fire or police or EMS or somebody else. Okay, while you're talking to people in 911, you need to do all these things. First of all, stay calm. Stay calm. I, yes, yes, I, we understand it's an emergency. You're scared. You're terrified. You're worried that about your loved one. However, if you yell into the phone, if you talk too fast, then the operator will not understand what you're saying. Instead of acting on the information you're sharing, they're just going to waste time saying, please repeat that, please repeat that, what did you say? They may, and, worst, and the worst of the possibilities is they misunderstand you. You said one thing, or you screamed one thing, but they heard, they thought you heard you say something else. And the wrong resources are sent to the wrong place. That is absolutely worst case scenario, right? So please stay calm. I, your heart is pounding. Um, yeah, the worst case situations are rushing through your imagination, but you need to speak clearly and calmly and normal speed normal speed the uh, our our technology has spent all of their resources technology commercial commercial products commercial electronic products have focused all of their resources on the megapixel camera and getting more and more apps but the quality of the voice does not seem to have improved much in our technology. So you can still come across distorted, uh, static, full of static, difficult to understand. So normal volume, normal speed is the best way to tell the 911 operator what's going on. And then briefly explain what happened. Don't talk about your relationship with this patient other than I don't talk about your history with this patient. Tell them if your uh, son, daughter, husband, wife, parent. It's a, okay. Of course, you have to say that. Uh, friend, classmate, coworker. Okay, but let let it go at that. And then very briefly say what's going on. The longer you take to get this information across, the longer it will take them to direct the appropriate resources to you. Know where you are. This is a good thing to figure out while you're dialing the phone. You could, if there are more than you, more than one of you around, you can designate somebody else to figure out where you are, the street intersection, the actual address, um, other things like that. Okay. That's just, way, if, you're, if you don't know and the operator asks the obvious question, where are you? And you have to now pause for uh, several seconds, for a minute, trying to figure out where you are, that's not, that's not good, right? That's wasting time. Age and gender. Why does it matter to know the age and gender? Um, that is one of the, that's the first two pieces of information that healthcare providers share with each other before they go into the rest of the, the detail about a patient. I have a 54 year old male complaining of, I have a 26 year old female complaining of. So it's a good, you don't have to be specific on the age, you can say, um, a child, baby, child, teenager, young adult, middle age, elderly. That's good enough for now. And then when EMS gets there, they can get specifics. What about the gender? What are you supposed to assume their gender in these days and age? Well, the real reason for this is that New York State EMS or New York State um, Healthcare has not kept pace with current identity uh, identity policies and procedures. So they are still expecting a gender. Also, in medicine, there are certain diseases that are more prevalent with one gender than another gender. And that's why healthcare workers like to know. Once you get this piece of information, like I have a young man hit by a car, please, send help, hurry, we are at Main Street and First Avenue on the intersection. And now the 911 operator will start to ask other questions. And I don't want to go into the details of what else that they can ask. They have a script. They have this flow sheet, uh, this flow chart of other things to fill in 
once you get the basic information in. This is very important. They're not just asking just to um, shoot the breeze. They're not asking just to be pleasant or to dot the I's and cross the T's. They are asking questions that will refine which resources are sent to which emergency. New York State, New York City, New York City EMS is the largest emergency medical system in the world. Other cities are bigger. Yes, other cities have higher, larger population, but it's New York City EMS that is the largest, the most ambulances, the most uh, in-depth organiza organizational structure because there's always an emergency going on somewhere in the city. Before 911, typically there were about 4,000 emergency calls, EMS calls per day, per day. During the pandemic, there was eight, it went up to 8,000 calls per day, and now it's more like uh, 6,000 to 7,000 calls per day. So to send everybody to each emergency as it comes up is just not practical. Uh, it's taking resources away from other emergencies. And so they need to make sure the right resource gets to the right place. So please answer the questions. Don't fight them, don't argue with them, don't tell them, I don't give a F what you're dealing, you know, what you need to know. Send everybody now, send everybody now. No, they're not gonna do that. Instead, they're gonna stay on the line and try to keep pulling more information out of you. The best thing you can do for your loved one is to answer the questions as quick, as soon as you can, as soon as they ask them, so the right resources can go. New for 2023, leave your favorite theories out of this. You may feel very strongly about a certain issue. You can, there's, there's a way to address this that will not delay the arrival of resources, the, the right resources for your loved one. So don't fill out this 911 call. Uh, don't drag it out. Don't get into an argument. Uh, so leave your favorite theories out of this. Once this is done, they will transfer you to the EMS operator and you'll have to do this all over again. The 911, the EMS operator will get on the line and they will start asking things and a, many of the questions will be redundant. They will ask the same question the other operator asked just like five seconds ago. This is not the time to scream at them and say, I just answered that question. Why can't you people get your facts straight? You know, uh, this is incompetence and start going off on one of your favorite theories. If you want to have the right resource, get to your loved one as soon as possible. Just answer the question again. In fact, you should be able to answer it even faster because you answered it the first time. Work with them, don't work against them. Get this, get this phase of the emergency call over with as soon as possible. Okay. All right, so they said that they got your information, they dispatched an ambulance, a fire truck, maybe a police car, and now all you have to do is wait for them to get here, right? Um, well, there's a few things you can do now after you hang up the phone, and one of them is keep that line free. If they need to call you back, that's the number they're going to use. So if immediately after you make the call, you use the same phone to call somebody else, then, and then you get like uh, a call waiting. Now you don't know who that call waiting is from. Is it 911 trying to get back in touch with you? Or is it like your friends want to tell you about a cat's video? Who is this person? And so instead you should try to keep this phone free. If you don't have another choice and you need to call uh, the patient's parents or the patient's children, adult children, okay, then you gotta do what you gotta do. But be aware that 911 may try to call you back. They may need to get more information. They need, may need to get a clarification. Maybe there was a miscommunication in the first call and now they need to verify, such as the address. There have been many times when I responded to a 911 call where I showed up at the wrong place. And I come to the location that dispatch gave me 
everything seems peaceful, the nobody in the intersection looking for 911, or even worse, I, wake, I went all the way up six flights of stairs because the elevator's broken to apartment 6B, and I knock on the door, 911, EMS, did somebody call 911? And then the occupants say, no, we didn't call 911, go away. And like that's, and so we get back on the dispatch and say, dispatch, we're at the site, we're, we are 1084, 1088, we're on the scene, nobody's calling for 911, can we get a call back to verify address? And then 911 has to call you back, right? So they need access. If possible, try to get, for you, try to get another person on your team. And so they will call the people who need to be called from your side so you can keep your phone free. If it is safe, remember always if it's safe, keep at least one person with the patient at all times. The situation is known to you, but how do you know the situation didn't change? Maybe the, their condition is deteriorating. Maybe through altered mental status, personality change, they stand up and start to walk away, even though that is not the the thing to do. So one person needs to stay with the patient at all times. Oh, there's a chat. Another piece of info that 911 needs is a phone number or caller and yeah, in case they get cut off. Right. So stay with the stay with your phone in case they need to call you back or you you get disconnected, of course. Okay. Now, as long as one person is always with the patient, another great idea is to have a second person wait outside. There have been so many times when I respond, especially to an apartment in New York City, especially in Brooklyn, but you know, any apartment around the five, I've worked in all five boroughs, except Staten Island. I worked in four boroughs except Staten Island. And there have been many apartments where we're sitting outside the main door trying to get buzzed in. You know, we, we go to the panel where it's like apartments one through six and letters A through Z and we're trying to, we buzz the number and then waiting for uh, somebody to buzz us in. It would, and that's like a waste of five to 10 minutes right there. So if you can have a second person waiting near the main door to not only open the door for us, but even waiting outside so that as the ambulance rolls up, they, that person can wave their hands to get our attention. So as we're, as we're inching, inchworm crawling down the street going where what's the address 157 all right we are at 149 151 oh there's 153 okay and so we're slowly trying to find this address and if it, it, it would be much faster and easier there's like hey wait there's a person down the road there down the street oh they're waving their hands at us maybe they're the ones we're after so we can drive right up to that person instead saving time but this other person who's outside is only secondary. You have to have at least one person always with the patient. Okay, now, uh, once EMS arrives, oh wait, okay, Th this should have been two slides, okay. Um, if we knew, like for example, that the address is 157 Main Street, why are we pausing at 149 Main Street? Why don't we just zoom right down to 157? These street, these address numbers are hard to see from the street. And one of the problems is many houses use the same color for the number and the wall behind it. Like they put dark, dark brown on a black background, or they use light beige on a white background. And it's really hard to make it out from the middle of the street. Uh, another problem is at night. Uh, so most of my shifts were always overnight. I never liked doing daytime shifts because the uh, it was it just gets too hot. So and our air conditioner doesn't always work. So I always preferred overnight. Besides, I'm working somewhere else during the day. Anyway, <clears throat> at three o'clock in the morning, when the color contrast between the number and the background are too close then it's really, really hard to see at night. Sometimes we have to get out the flashlight and shine it on the houses as we drive by to make sure to look for the right place. So before you call 911, 
the the previous slide was after you call 911. See here, after. But there are some things where you that you can do before you call 911. So how are you supposed to know you're going to call 911? Like, of course not. Nobody can predict an emergency. However, what you can do is make your make your area more efficient in case there's an emergency. For example, next after this lecture, when you get home, before you go into your home, stand outside on the sidewalk, look for the address number, and ask yourself, is this clearly visible at night? Let's say, and even if there's a floodlight shining on the address, what, hap what about one day the floodlight is broken? The lamp goes out and now it's not working. Is it still visible at night? If not, then you should look into changing the colors so that you have maximum contrast for best visibility. Another thing you can do before you call 911 is have a list of medications for everybody in the house who's on more than one or two medications. One of the things that EMS will ask once we get there, after we make sure the patient is not going to die immediately, checking airway, breathing, circulation, mental status, after that's done and secured and the patient is stabilized, another thing we're going to ask is what medications you are on. Right? Makes sense. Doctor is always asked that. The medical assistant asks you that when you go to your doctor's appointment. Well, they, have, they can ask it in a casual, slow pace because you're at a medical appointment. You are stable. But now, you, this is an emergency. Everything is happening faster. And the, now the EMT or the paramedic is in a situation where uh, they ask, are you on any medication? And then if somebody is especially sick, then they bring out the shoe box or the cookie tin. And in it are a half dozen to two dozen medical vials, pill vials. And now somebody has to write all of this down into the pre-hospital care report so that the doctors can see it. If there are too many medications, then what we sometimes do is just ask you, can you put, uh, like a, a, a family member, can you put all of this in a plastic bag and bring it with you so we can show it to the doctor? So that's, um, that's one way to do it, but a even better way, even better way is to keep your own list of medications for, your, for anybody who is on two or more medications, keep it in a list. Where do you keep this list? Well, um, now we're all in the internet age, so first keep it in a editor so you can update it easily, and then print copies. Keep one copy, small print in your wallet, and keep another one taped or magnetized to the fridge because that's where EMS tends to look, in, uh, at the fridge door. And another one, an obvious place, is behind the, the medicine mirror in the bathroom. So there are three places you can keep. Also, of course, a list in the chew box or the cookie tin where you keep the medications. Uh, <clears throat> speaking of that, now what about like confidentiality? You know, I don't want my neighbors, I don't want visiting guests seeing my list of medications and, di and diagnosis, my list of medical conditions. So well, you can put it in an envelope, seal it, and then what you do is write on the envelope for EMS, emergency medical information, medical emergency information, or for EMS. And then if you want to go the extra step beyond, you can put this little picture here. So go on to Google, type EMS star of life, print one from your, your printer. It doesn't even have to be blue. It can be black and white if you don't have a color printer. And then cut it out with scissors and tape it to the envelope. This will really pull our eyes, grab our attention, and we know to grab this envelope, rip it open, see, look what's inside. Okay, so now EMS is there. You call 911 and now EMS has arrived. What are, gonna, are, what are they gonna ask? Well, here's a list of things they're gonna ask. I'm not gonna dwell on this list because I only have 15 minutes left. But what I will do is make this slide show available to anybody who wants it. 
Um, I have a list of attendees, of student attendees. Anybody else who would like this list, if you don't, if you don't take a screenshot right now, which you could do, take a screenshot right now of this list, uh, you can ask me for a copy of this slideshow and I'll be happy to provide it to you. But anyway, these are the most common questions that first responders, well, EMTs and paramedics ask. Um, the nurse and the doctor will also ask these questions when you get to the hospital too. Okay, um, something else you can do before EMS arrives. So bef after you call 911 and before EMS arrives, something else you can do for your loved one is if, if they have a pulse and they are breathing, then you can roll them into something called recovery position. I borrowed this picture from the American Heart Association, AHA. I hope they don't mind. I'm not monetizing this lecture anyway. And the purpose of this recovery position is if they vomit, then they won't inhale the vomit. That's pretty much as simple as that. It's called recovery position. We teach that in CPR, by the way. Okay, now at the beginning of this lecture, I did say that we're not gonna focus on any patient care specifics, but that was not completely true. There are two exceptions because these are especially important, especially urgent, and I, I, I believe it's simple enough for non-healthcare providers to understand and remember. Diabetes, one of the biggest, most prevalent diseases in America becoming the world and especially around here in New York City. So uh, not to get into the details of it, but the big problem with diabetes is that the sugar level in the blood is too high, so diabetics are often on medications that bring the sugar down. That's for long-term medical, medical uh, treatment. The problem for 911 is that sometimes these medications work too well and they bring the sugar too low and that is another life-threatening emergency. Now, for people who don't know any better, no medical, no healthcare training or background, we're used to thinking somebody is sick, they're taking medications for that sickness. If they are now really, really sick for that reason, help them take their meds, right? Well, the one exception here is in diabetes because like I just said, a common 911 emergency regarding diabetes is that the sugar is too low, blood sugar is too low, and if you help them take their medications, you're helping bring their sugar even lower, more low. That is a disaster. So I'm telling you with this slide, if you have somebody who is a known diabetic history of diabetes, and now they are suddenly confused. How do you know they're confused? Person, place, time, and event. Do they know their name? Can they say their name? Do they know what day of the week it is? Do they know where they are? Do they know what's happening? And don't let anybody else answer for them. This is not a quiz, okay? This is a test of their mental status. If they cannot answer any one of them, and, they, and you know they're a diabetic, call 911. And then do not help them take their medications. Now, when you, if the issue is their sugar is too low, then should we help them eat something like sugar, fruit juice, something like that to help bring it back up? Well, if they are able to swallow, then yes, but if they can't swallow, then no, because if you push water or solids into their mouth and they have trouble controlling their swallowing reflex, then instead of swallowing it, they will inhale it, they will choke on it, and now we have even a bigger problem than just diabetes. How, do you, how can you tell if they're able to swallow or not, if they're able to control their airway, if they're able to control, they have an active gag reflex, well, take a first aid class, take a CPR course, we'll tell you all about it. So, if you're not sure, 
don't give them anything, but definitely call 911. Okay. Stroke. So there are many, many different kinds of strokes, and strokes come in all sizes. There's the, the giant stroke, the full body stroke, well, one side. Uh, but then there are micro strokes, mini strokes too. So we're not going to talk about the micro and mini strokes, but the large strokes, the large vessel uh, strokes, there's a way to know, and that's called FAST. If you Google for stroke, Google image for stroke, you'll find lots and lots of pictures saying FAST, which is you look for face droop, one side face droop. Uh, one of the arms is unable to stay up in the air by themselves, and the speech is slurring because the muscles of the face are unilateral, one-sided is paralyzed, so they cannot speak clearly. And then the T is time, it's time to call 911. T also means when was their last known well? When was the last time you saw them well? For example, you wake up this person because they're going to be late for work. It is now seven o'clock in the morning and you notice that they are experiencing one or more of these symptoms. And then you call 911 and they finally arrive, say around 7.15, 7.20, and they ask you, when was their last known well? Well, the last time you saw them was 9 p.m. last night when you said good night. So 7 a.m. minus 9 p.m. is how many hours? Anybody can do math in the chat? Can anybody guess? From 9 p.m. to 7 a.m., how many hours is that? While you're figuring that out, let me continue here. Somebody in the chat put the number in. So you figure this out, you tell them the number, okay? And they say, got it, thank you. And then they transport you and your loved one to the hospital. And then you arrive, and then the nurse there, the triage nurse, asks you, when was the last no well? And then you get angry at her and start yelling at her or him and say, why can't you guys get your story straight? There's just nothing but incompetence. This happens every time, uh, blah, 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 blah. You're wasting time. You are wasting time. You already know the number, which is not 12 minus, 12 minus 9 is 3, and then 7 uh, minus 12 is 7. So, so it's... Uh, 10, right, because 9 to 9 is 12, so 9 to 7 is 10. Correct, Nicolette. So you already know the number because you told the EMTs that. So just tell them the number. Because guess what? After the EMS gets a report to the triage nurse, they're going to move the patient to um, one of the trauma bays or the emergency bays in the ER, and then the attending, the physician, will go and come up and talk to you about your patient, and they will ask, when was your last no well? So you just tell them, 10 hours. And then the neuro neurological consult will arrive like five or 10 minutes later. Guess what they're gonna ask you? When was the last known well? So just have the number ready, and even before they finish the phrase, last known well, just tell them, 10 hours, 9 p.m. to 7 a.m. There, see how you're helping to move the process along? You're helping to make this inefficient process more efficient. Just for this and any other uh, relevant pieces of information, keep it in your head and just be ready to say it as soon as it's asked. Okay, that is for specific medical emergencies. The last couple of slides, let me just talk about what do you do for other people's emergencies. For example, you're driving down the highway and you hear a siren coming up to you, pull over and stop. You would think, of course everybody know that. No, they don't. Um, I worked on the ambulance and I can tell you, no, they don't. Some of them st uh, stay right in front of me and will not pull over. In fact, they see that everybody else is pulling over and they're thinking, oh good, they're pulling over for the ambulance. Here's my chance to cut a couple of minutes off of my commute. And they just stay in front and keep uh, moving up ahead, taking advantage of the situation. Um, so that's causing a traffic hazard. The ambulance accidents uh, are very frequent all over the world. So please pull over. 
That means you have to hear the ambulance. That means do not play your inside car stereo, uh, music so loud that you can't hear outside sirens. That's another thing that seems so obvious, but it's about as obvious as don't text and drive. People still do it anyway. By the way, speaking of ambulances on the road, have you ever noticed sometimes an ambulance will come up to a red light and they'll turn on their lights and sirens and cross ahead past the red light intersection. And as soon as they're on the other side, they turn off the siren and light and then go on driving normally. While here you are stuck behind the red light think, thinking, oh my God, what an abuse of power. Uh, they were, it's in a corrupt system taking advantage of you know, our trust. Um, sometimes, maybe they do it because after all, ambulances are staffed by, of all things, human beings, and human beings do sometimes do evil things. But there's another possibility, which happens to me a lot, which is we are minding our own business, waiting for a call, and then a call comes in. So we get the information, I get on the radio, 10, 4, 6, 3, we're on our way, and we turn on lights and sirens and go. And then, like, uh, sometime later, seconds later, minutes later, we get a call back from dispatch saying, you know, uh, our unit number, uh, 1087, your call, 1087, cancel uh, patient call back saying there's no emergency. And we say, 10, 4, thank you, and then we turn off our lights and sirens. So that's another possibility, and it happens a lot to us. Uh, we love it when it happens, but uh, that's a possibility. Okay. So that was medical emergencies, and now what about a countywide emergency, a citywide emergency, like a disaster? Uh, here, we, anybody remember Hurricane Sandy? So this one is, sorry, this one is my ambulance here. We were there instead uh, on the Rockaways response, part of the response system. Anyway, uh, and so why was I out here with a camera taking a picture? Well, we were waiting for our assignment. This is like a line of ambulances waiting for uh, to be assigned to somewhere. Okay, uh, this is the FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Association. They set up headquarters in this, I think it was a high school. Uh, anyway, um, what do you do in case of a disaster? Well, how are you supposed to know there's gonna be a disaster? Of course not, but you can be prepared, such as have a go bag, have an emergency bag, have a plan. If you have children in your, you know, your family has children, then do they understand where to go in case they lose contact with you? And what about this disaster bag or, or emergency bag? Um, I'm not gonna give you specifics, and here's a slide of specifics. Okay, so here's an idea of things you can put in your bag, but you don't, I'm not saying you have to have these, it's just put things in your emergency bag that make sense for you, and here's a starting list. You can Google for other lists and pick and choose as you like. And the beauty of these go bags is not just for the apocalypse or for a zombie invasion, it's just that what happens if um, four o'clock in the morning, a firefighter bangs on your door saying, there's a fire in your building, evacuate now, now, now. So all you have, you barely have time to put on your coat and shoes and you're still in your pajamas, you have to rush out of the building while everything you have burns down. It would be best if you had an emergency bag in the closet that you can grab and go. Uh, even better to have both one in the closet and one in your trunk of your car. So you, if you have to rush out, you can just grab your coat, shoes, and car keys, rush out with your family, and now you have some emergency supplies in your car that can hold you over until you can get your life back together. So an idea. Okay, if you're gonna put something in your car in New York City, make sure it's something that's replaceable you know, don't put irreplaceable things anyway there. So I'm at the end of my lecture. I hope you guys got something out of this and I appreciate your attending this seminar. Any questions?
please place in the chat or speak up. Otherwise, thank you for being here. We are done. Anybody want to? Thank you.